it's my pleasure to welcome uh, Todd Constable here with us, to be with us this afternoon. And in my worldview, uh, Todd lives in a sort of parallel universe. I mean that in a good way. And he's, uh, we don't directly correspond that much, but I think our, somehow our thinking seems to run in a sort of similar parallel course. So I'm always interested in, th in hearing about what he's thinking about, so I can tell what I'm thinking about. <laughs> and so, uh, uh, let me uh, just, without further ado, welcome him to talk on uh, brain regions and connections and uh, functional phenotypes. Great. Uh, thanks a lot to Bruce, John, and Larry for inviting me. Uh, so I've been sitting down the road at Yale University uh, for the 20 years that you guys have been working at 7T. And uh, my primary thought is, damn, there's a lot of good people at NGH. And so I sit there kind of envious of all the stuff that goes on here. But it's, it's really cool to be here and to be celebrating this with you guys. Uh, so I'm here to uh, dissuade you from taking uh, Bob Turner's talk too seriously. <laughs> no, not really. Uh, what I'm here for is to talk about, uh, as you're imaging at 7T, and measuring explicit uh, uh, anatomical properties, uh, as Bob pointed out, and, and Peter Vanatini has uh, shown some amazing work at Layers, too. Uh, my chief argument here today is to argue about the, or to argue for uh, keeping in mind the functional flexibility of the brain and the flexibility of that functional architecture within the fixed architecture that these neuroanatomists are uh, imaging with uh, 7T and, and uh, other methods. And so uh, I'm going to actually um, put this in the context of brain mapping in general and talk a little bit about how, you know, what we're trying to do when we uh, talk about how to understand how the brain works. Um, mapping typically, as I understand the field of human brain mapping, is to assign a function to a region. Uh, and so there are two challenges associated with that, at least two. One is defining the region and the other is defining the function. Uh, and so I'm going to kind of focus my talk around those two challenges. Uh, lesion studies, you know, as we all uh, have been around for a long time and they provide an understanding of which areas are critical and there's lots of uh, history behind all of this. Um, but the implicit assumption here is that the, a brain region has a function and uh, typically people are focused on a particular function for a particular region. Um, the other is that, and, and so there's a, a fundamental kind of assumption of a one-to-one -one mapping of a region to function. Um, and that's been the majority of task-based fMRI studies since the early 90s, right? Everybody has their favorite tasks and they would tweak their tasks. And the whole reason I got into resting state fMRI is that I didn't know, you know what the next task tweak should be. And if I could do resting state, I didn't have to worry about tasks. So that was really cool. Um, but you know, so you can develop you know, uh, theories like the amygdala is responsible for emotion and the hippocampus is uh, involved in memory. Uh, but what we're finding certainly uh, with functional connectivity, and you saw some uh, connectivity maps in the last talk, uh, which just shows how extensive uh, and involved and complex these circuits are. And so, you know, we start to get maps like this and we say, well, is the amygdala really responsible for emotion or is it a little more complicated than that? And I think we need to embrace the, uh, em embrace the complication. Uh, and when we show maps like this, uh, people want to, the natural response is, well, what area is really driving this? And I think that's the wrong uh, question to ask. There isn't an area of driving this. This is a system. And we need to start thinking about the brain more from a systems point of view. And so that's one of my arguments for today. Um, so functional connectivity shows extensive involvement of these complex circuits. And I think these are real. They're, they're difficult to get our heads around. And you want to kind of say to yourself, well, what's driving this? But I think that's what's driving it. Um, and we're going to have to learn to be comfortable with the complexity of the brain. And maybe it's not surprising that the brain is complicated. Um, what I'm mostly going to focus on right now, though, is the assumptions of this fixed functional organization. And this is where uh, I'm going to talk about Bob Turner's work a little bit, uh, well, not explicitly. But um, you know, certainly when you're doing myelography and uh, cytoarchitecture and things like that, there is a uh, fixed structural organization, 
But what I want people to think about a little bit more is the functional flexibility within that structure. And so there's several things that go into this. Uh, so we, I've been working on this kind of a, uh, mapping uh, human behavior to the functional connectome. So, you know, Emily Finn, who's now with Peter Vanatini, had this fingerprinting paper showing that your functional connectome uh, is actually unique and it uh, tells us something about you. Uh, and to really do this functional connectivity, you need an atlas. And so somehow you, you get an atlas for the brain, you look at all the different connections between regions and you get a functional connectome. And that's what the whole human connectome project was uh, focused on. Uh, uh, which was to develop, you know, get a map of what the functional phenotype for humans looks like. Uh, so this is your functional connectome. This is actually what it looks like for, a, this is a 268 squared matrix. So there's about 35,000 connections uh, uh, in this half. So it's, we don't have directional information, so it's uh, symmetric across the diagonal. And basically there's 35,000 edges here uh, in a 268 node atlas, if you go to something like the uh, Glaster atlas, which is 360 nodes, there's about 70,000 connections in here. I think there's a lot of information in these connections, and Hans, this is what you should be uh, pulling out here. Uh, there's a lot of information in these connections about a person, okay? This tells us something about you. These connections are unique, your patterns are unique, and there's a lot of information here. We've related it to uh, fluid intelligence, attention, autism symptoms, personality, and uh, from Banatini's lab, they've uh, related this to reading recall. So I, one of my main focuses these days is on how to build models that, that extract this information. And with the whole RDoc approach to uh, psychiatry, we wanna build models on symptom scores. So you know we're all on the paranoia scale somewhere. So where are you on that paranoia scale? And can we build a model so we can do your resting state fMRI and tell where you are on that paranoia scale? Um, so that's one thing to do with that. But actually what I'm gonna mostly focus on right now is, is the problem, uh, the first problem in that step, which is to define an atlas. So there, there's a ton of interest in how do we break the brain up into these nodes. Um, oh, before I talk about nodes, actually, one of the things, uh, the first thing I'm going to do is talk about networks, actually. So uh, one of the things you can do with a matrix like this and with nodes like this is you can look at the time courses of the individual nodes and you can cluster those and you can say, well, which nodes form networks? And what are the, what's the network organization here in this brain? And so uh, some of that, uh, some of the early network stuff was done from uh, here with Randy Buckner uh, and Thomas Yeo. And, and they defined uh, two network systems, a seven and a 17 uh, node network. Uh, and these are used very uh, commonly by many, many groups, including ourselves. Uh, and this was some really nice work to define, to break the brain up into these systems, basically. And we know, for example, the default mode system is one of the uh, most prominent networks that we know about. Um, and so you can break the brain up into these uh, systems. And so we did that. We took our nodes, actually, and we did functional connectivity with the nodes to cluster those. And what we found is that um, the nodes, if you look at them in different cognitive states, so rather move away from resting state and go back into tasks now, if you do these under the conditions of continuous performance tasks, what you find is that the networks reconfigure and they reconfigure specifically uh, in, in specific ways depending on which task you're doing. Uh, and so uh, we just had this paper come out in uh, NeuroImage on this. Uh, showing flexible networks. And if you, uh, these are the flexible networks basically uh, for resting state, uh, social tasks. This is from the HCP data using some uh, 718 subjects. You could get slightly different network definitions uh, according to uh, the brain state. And if you looked at the individual nodes that are uh, uh, changing their membership, for example, what you could find was that there are some flexible nodes uh, that have pretty consistent uh, cross-subject uh, network assignments, uh, but uh, cross-state they changed a lot. Um, and or th these are the stable ones, sorry. No, these are the flexible ones here, and, and there's noisy ones here, and then there's steady nodes that don't change their assignment at all. So 75 out of 268 nodes, uh, or 72 out of 268 nodes didn't change their uh, 
membership at all. So we have these anchor nodes and then we have the, within that we have these flexible nodes that depending on which task you're doing, they work together with other, uh, they join other networks basically. And so here we have a flexible architecture, a functional architecture within a fixed infrastructure. Uh, so these nodes group together in different ways, depending on the task at hand. Uh, another thing to do, which is what I uh, started talking about uh, a few minutes ago, was that we could look at how these nodes are defined. Uh, we've been interested in the parcellation problem, as have many people. And uh, Bob Turner mentioned the parcellation problem uh, from a myelography point of view. Um, but if functional connectivity, uh, if, if we're going to generate a functional connectome, we need some sort of atlas to impose. Uh, and so functional connectivity can be used to parcelate the brain into nodes. And then uh, we can ask, are these node definitions consistent under uh, different states? I, when I first started on this, I thought we were going to define the functional atlas. And I told my postdoc, Shilin Shen at the time, you know, there's the Brahman atlas and then there'll be the Shen atlas for, you know, function. Uh, the Brahman Atlas for Cytoarchitecture, Architecture. And so um, we worked on that for several years and many, many other people have been working on that for several years. And uh, so we have the Brahman Atlas, uh, there's this uh, Atlas out of Montreal, there's various functional atlases based on fMRI, and there's actually a ton of activity uh, around the whole parcellation problem. Uh, the literature is greatly expanding here and everybody's looking for the ideal atlas. Uh, there is a point of view, uh, which I somewhat agree with, which is that all these atlases are wrong. Um, but they are also, uh, I do think they have meaningful information and I'm hopefully going to relay some of that to you. Uh, they, some people argue that even if they're wrong, it's okay because it's a good data reduction strategy. Uh, and that's fine too. Uh, in many cases, certainly with that behavioral modeling, when we're doing the brain uh, functional phenotyping, it, it's not highly sensitive to which atlas you use. So we've used many different atlases and we get kind of the similar, similar results in terms of the predictive ability of our algorithms. But I do think there's meaningful information in how these atlases are defined. And uh, that's what I'm gonna talk about here. So I mentioned Shi Lin Shen was a postdoc with me and she uh, was originally doing this work. Uh, so based on resting state data, we uh, developed our own atlas. So this is available online. Uh, there's a 268 node atlas and there's a 368 node atlas. These were kind of a combination of k-means clusterings and, and other algorithms. And the weird number is that we wanted 300 nodes, but we got 268. And then we wanted 400 nodes, but we got 368. So those are why we have those funny numbers. But so these atlases are available and they work well uh, for doing predictive modeling in terms of linking behavior to these functional phenotypes. But one of the things we, uh, oh, and here's some of the other atlases. So there's a Cameron Craddock atlas. Uh, Tom Yeo has a 300 node. Uh, this Matt Glasser one's fairly high profile. I forget, sorry, I keep meaning to look up how many are in the power atlas, but I forget. Uh, and the Gordon atlas has uh, 333 nodes. Uh, all of these are based on resting state data. The Glasser one is resting state plus myelography and, and some other things like that, cytoarchitecture plus some drawing uh, by the uh, neuroanatomists. Um, so though, there's lots of atlases and to be honest, to do predictive modeling in, uh, with behavioral analysis, you can use any of these because you have, you know, 35,000 or 77,000 connections in there you know, slightly changing a few of those connections uh, with different node definitions doesn't greatly influence uh, your, your results. Um, but it turns out that these node definitions are brain state dependent. And so I think what I wanna point, what I wanna emphasize here is that you have to use some sense when you're applying these atlases and start to think about, you know, what the sense, of, what, what does it mean to have a functional atlas? Um, so in order to look at this, in fact, it, it was a brain connectivity meeting here in Boston probably five years ago that I started to think about this problem. But um, in order to look at how the nodes change with brain state, uh, you need an algorithm uh, that maintains node correspondence uh, uh, under different conditions. And so that, that you can always know that node one goes to node one. Uh, in order to compare atlases. So uh, we had to develop that. Uh, we started with a group atlas, and so you can start with any sort of group atlas. And then what we were doing was we were individualizing that atlas. So uh, Bob Turner mentioned the importance, particularly when you go to high field, of having individualized atlases. And this is an approach where you can develop an individualized atlas for each individual. 
Uh, what I also want to point out, though, is that there's not just one atlas for each individual, that each atlas is actually brain state dependent. And that's the primary uh, take home message from, from this. So we imaged me, I have some use in the lab still, we imaged me 30 times uh, over about nine months. And I was doing six continuous performance tasks and two rest tasks. And the reason we did me is that hopefully over that period of time, I don't have a lot of anatomic uh, brain changes. And so that the only changes that should be visible, if there are any changes, would be functional changes associated with doing these six different tasks. So I had a subject group of 30 then, uh, 30 clones of me, let's say. So there's no anatomic uh, variability, or at least minimal. I didn't gain too much and things like that. Uh, so the uh, hypothesis was that the parcellation would be consistent from day to day and within a condition, but it would vary by condition or by these tasks. And so these were uh, some tasks that tapped. It's actually from the RDoc uh, cognitive domain. So there's uh, a memory task, emotion task, re a reward task, response inhibition task. Uh, everybody likes watching movies, so I watched The Princess Bride over and over and over again. Uh, and then uh, there's this graduated continuous performance task, which was an attention to task uh, as well. We did rest at the beginning and rest at the end. All of these, so none of these are designed as GLM sort of, you know, on off task uh, blocks. These are continuous performance tasks. So the entire run of six minutes for each of these is filled with, you know, in back continuously for six minutes. I'm terrible, by the way, at the two back. Um, so we could then parcelate my brain across those 30 sessions and then look at you know, how close the parcellations are to each other. And we can see, for example, the movies is kind of out here, uh, way out here. It's very different brain state in the movie condition. Uh, but some of these other tasks, like the response inhibition task and the grad CPT, they both have components of inhibition and attention in them. Uh, these are somewhat similar over here. Uh, so you can, what we're showing here then is that we can get reproducible parcellations under different brain states for the same brain. Uh, and we can look at this a number of ways. So this is looking at parcellation similarity. Uh, this is uh, Hamming uh, distance here. And this is just node size similarity. And so on the diagonal for the end back, uh, all, there's, there's like 30 lines in, in each of these and they all look very similar. Uh, the rest conditions are very similar. Movies is very different from all the other conditions. And if you plot this similarity, parcellation, uh, one minus the Hamming distance or the node size, you can see that these distributions are distinct. So this is within a condition and this is between conditions in terms of the similarity. So there's very distinct differences uh, in these parcellations as a function of brain state. Uh, and so we can convert, we can take the 268 nodes, let's say, uh, and we can make that a vector uh, just of node size. And actually, it turned out we could predict uh, which condition uh, I was in by that node size vector. So if you reduce that just to a single vector of 268 nodes, the node sizes tell you which condition I was in. And we could predict that condition with like 60 or 70 percent accuracy. Uh, uh, across basically all the tasks, not so good in the stop signal task. You could also actually predict within uh, scanner performance uh, somewhat, you know, uh, uh, four to 16% of the variance accounted for, for some of these tasks that had continuous uh, performance measures in the, in the magnet. So that's just based on the node size vector. So this suggests that it's potentially meaningful information in terms of how uh, much your parcellation looks like it should for that condition. Uh, then you could say, well, is it just something weird about my brain? Uh, the, uh, and we can say that, no, it's not just my brain. Uh, the Midnight Scan Club, they ran 10 subjects, but two of them had a lot of motion, so we dropped two of them. Uh, they ran uh, 10 subjects 10 times. And so here we're still doing a within subject parcellation comparison. Okay, so this is not a cross subject. Uh, we're doing within subject uh, and they had different tasks. So they had some semantic, uh, semantic coherence tasks, some memory tasks and some motor tasks, but you can kind of still see there's distinct subgroups of parcellations in here uh, for these eight subjects imaged uh, 10 times. Uh, it's not quite as clean as it is with my data, um, but they were scanning at midnight, different tasks and things. Um, so at least it's not just me. It seems like there is some reproducibility to this. And then you can say, well, 
what if we add in anatomic variations? Are these rearrangements detectable even factoring in anatomic variations? And the answer to that is yes, they are. So this is 514 subjects from the HCP data. And so now we're going across subjects here and we can still see, now the numbers are very high, we can still see very discrete, you know, within uh, task similarity and uh, between task differences. And so even at the group level, we're detecting this rearrangement of the nodes as a function of brain state. Um, and so you could say, well, this is a two, what I've shown you so far is for the 268 Atlas. We did this at a bunch, oh, we could also predict uh, which task for both the, the um, Midnight Scan Club data and the HCP data. So you could say, is this just because uh, the nodes are too big? You know, ultimately, I would think that if you go down to a small enough uh, uh, node size, they shouldn't change. But even at 5,000 nodes, which is, uh, this is only, actually, this picture here is only 1,000 nodes. Um, if you go to 5,000 nodes, we still see very reproducible uh, change. So <clears throat> let me get to uh, the crux of this. Uh, which is that uh, if you think about, so here's our nodes, each row here is a node, and these are different uh, behavioral domains. And this is, if you go to the brain map data uh, base, you can pull out behavioral domains for a given location. And so for each node, we can look at all these behavioral domains. And the bottom line here is that there's a ton of different behaviors assigned to each node. Uh, and so why is that? How are we supposed to think about this? If we do some uh, quick neuronal math here, uh, 400 node atlas uh, with about 16 billion neurons. Uh, that's about 40 million neurons per node. Uh, and so if we assume that each node has a fixed function, we're kind of implicitly assuming, or we're explicitly assuming that all those 40 million neurons do the same thing. And I think we know from, you know, mapping cortical columns, which people have done at 7T, that there's a lot of fine grained <coughs> functional organization in the brain and human brain mapping for the most part ignores that. Uh, so this is a basic assumption, uh, but we see that there's this disconnect. People are not happy with how brain mapping has gone. We cannot seem to find a function for a region other than, unless it's gross like vision for visual cortex. Uh, and so one of the solutions has been come up with a new language, new labels, maybe the labels are wrong and we just need different labels. But uh, I'm going to uh, dissuade you of that with this cartoon here. So I'm going to say there's four neurons per voxel. And uh, with a 2300 node atlas, we have about a, uh, what is that, six by six uh, uh, voxel <laughs> atlas. And within that, we could have four different neurons that are tuned slightly differently to different aspects of tasks. And these are the different tunings, the red, the yellow, the green, the gray. This is all within Bob's nice cytoarchitecture or mylar architecture. Everything's fixed, but the neurons within that have different tunings and there we know there's subspecialization. There's tons of evidence for that. And what we're picking up, I think, is that the neurons mix and match according to inputs and outputs. And we get these different patterns that we're actually sensitive to at the functional parcellation level. And this, I think, is the explanation for that. And you guys at 70 need to, uh, to prove this. Well, there's lots of evidence for this, uh, MVPA and hyperalignment. We know the visual cortex has like 140 million neurons and they're organized in columns and all sorts of different ways according to what the stimulus is. We're now at Yale, we're doing these mouse studies where we're doing simultaneous fMRI and mesoscopic calcium imaging. And you get these patterns on the cortex uh, uh, in the calcium imaging, and they're associated with specific neurons. Uh, so even single neurons in a little patch of cortex right there, even individual neurons there are associated with different patterns on the cortex. Uh, so we just had this paper out in Nature Methods. And we know from uh, IT cortex, there's regions responsible for uh, face and color. And there's actually a solution to how to deal with this from another Yo and Buckner paper. Uh, where they had a new uh, ontology for uh, association cortex. And they didn't emphasize it here, but they clearly showed for different definitions, different ontologic labels, they actually had overlapping cortical uh, regions in the, uh, in the uh, human association cortex, which they attributed to uh, connectivity uh, differences. 
but there is, you know, there is a way to solve this. And just last week, I think there was this thing, in, uh, again, in uh, C. elegans, showing that a single neuron actually had different uh, properties according to inputs and outputs. So one neuron was actually acting in different ways. So I think that, uh, you know, the brain's complicated. I think even though we can do these great things measuring uh, architecture and anatomy, we have to keep in mind that within that infrastructure, the brain is very, very flexible. And there's a lot of flexibility that we need to keep in mind as we define regions and we talk about regions um, and we can't ignore this complexity. Thanks.